we here? We're here, good. All right, it's 1700 and the open slot has been filled by Stank Dog in the Art of Electronic Deduction. This, this is Hope Six. We have, we have one announcement. Um, Dusty Corners of the Web has been canceled permanently. It is not coming back to my knowledge. There will be a presentation at 12.30 tonight by members of the Chaos Computer Club called Biometrics and Sci-Fi in this room. So if you're interested in that presentation, it will be at 12.30. There was a flight delay. Uh, Stank Dog has graciously agreed to uh, inform and entertain during this time. So I'll leave that to him. Well, we're going to try our best. OK, so welcome to hope number six, everyone. Having a good time so far? All right. I see that's what I need. Here we go. We've got a small crowd here, so everybody's got to pitch in, you know, help out with this. Uh, actually, this is a presentation. I'll, I'll tell you up front, it's going to be very fun. I am going to be calling on people from the audience to help out. It's very, it's something that everybody in here can do, and it's nothing deeply technical, but it's a very fun presentation, and it might put some things together that you maybe never thought about before and never looked at in this way before. So kind of keep that in mind, and it's going to be very fun and lighthearted, hopefully funny in some parts. And I guess to start off, the first thing would be to define what is electronic deduction. I don't know, I made it up. There's nothing important. Um, but it's basically looking at, um, it can be anything from screenshots, um, content, I guess would be the better word, focusing on content and what kind of patterns or interesting things can you find from something like a screenshot, uh, something like metadata inside of a files. Uh, we could do a whole talk, several hours of talks on metadata. We're going to touch on a little bit of that in the second half. But the first half of it, we're going to focus on looking at screenshots, shoulder surfing, things along those lines of what you can actually find out. Probably a lot more than people maybe realize. So um, it is a form of footprinting. If you want to look at it like that, if you're shoulder surfing, you're looking at somebody's uh, desk in their office, you can find out very quickly. You look at someone's laptop in here. Watch over your shoulder, everybody, right? You, I see you looking over somebody's shoulder. Um, seeing what kind of stuff they've got installed. It tells you a lot about who they are as a user. Um, and finding different patterns and discovering software that they use or, or different websites. So yeah, it sounds pretty simple. Yeah, it's, it's common sense hacking. As Fubster, one of the guys from our forums at binrev.com, pimp pimp, uh, has referred to it. And it very much is. It's common sense hacking. And you're going to find out that it is something everybody can do. But put a process to it of sitting down and thinking, well, what exactly does this mean? Sure, I see that they've got this application installed, but what does that really mean? So what if they've got something installed? The level of depth is where it comes into play, the depth of how much experience you have, how many software packages you've seen. Um, I've got some screenshots coming up. I've given this at a couple different meetings, and every time I give it, someone points out something new that I didn't even see. So it's all about the experience that you have and what you recognize and what you put together to kind of come up with. And obviously, if you have physical access and time available to sit there and really pound away at it, you can find a whole lot more. That's when you can start looking at metadata and things like that. So yes, this is very simple. And uh, what is the goal of doing this? Well, besides just being funny, kind of owning, dropping the docs, or whatever you want to refer to it as, um, try to build a case. Think of it, you know, go into Batman mode. Pretend you got your utility belt. Start uh, putting all this stuff together and build a case like, I'm going to prove that this laptop belongs to this person. Or um, if you want an actual truthful application when this might come in handy, if you do get busted, which hopefully nobody will do that, um, you can use these kind of things to say, look, I can't use Microsoft Office because I run Linux. Or I can't use XYZ because I run this. You, know, you can use these things to say, listen, I can prove that's not a screenshot of my computer because I don't have that. You, know, you can have that kind of stuff. Um, but None of these individually will stand on their own. They're all circumstantial evidence, if you want to think of it. So don't think that this is going to stand up in court as some kind of defense for anything. But you can build a case of a sequence of events and a lot of different things that will prove that something is or is not, or, or probably is or probably is not. You can never, I won't say never come to a 100% conclusion, but you can get pretty close. So coincidental evidence by itself is useless. So what if you're, this person uses Microsoft Office? So do a million other people. That doesn't really narrow it down or, or prove anything. Let's check 
There? There we go. I guess I can't move around here. Okay. But building a collection of coincidental evidence can help build a case. And, and this is kind of overkill, but I wanted to illustrate it to kind of make sure that the point gets across, is if you wanted to actually chart this and make this a process, and in security field, they like to make processes and steps and stages and measure everything, which is you know, not exactly the hacker way to do things, but to visualize it, think of different types of users. And I just made up a few here. You, know, you can see, I hope you, everybody can see OK, student, gamer, a home user, business user, a hacker. Just, again, made up examples. And I just used a 1 to 10 scale, positive and negative, starting in the center. And based on what you might find on someone's computer, you can kind of build a case for one or the other user. So for example, if you find a computer that has accounting software installed on it, Microsoft Office, Outlook is their client, uh, things like that, that's going to raise the percentage of the likelihood of it being a business user. Home users use some of those things too. So do students, but a gamer having an accounting software, a hacker having accounting software, kind of lowers that probability. So kind of keep that process in mind as you see some of these and think what kind of person this is and what kind of category they might fall into. Ah, I said at the very beginning, for those of you who just came in, this will be interactive, so I'm going to be, and it's, it's easy, trust me, and, and this is a very simple, nice example to start with. First of all, I mean, what operating system is this person using? Come on, I didn't stomp the whole room. Windows XP, obviously. We know that. Well, actually, not necessarily. Of course, people can skin things, and there's different windowing systems. You can trick people. But that's pretty obviously Windows XP. We all can tell that. Um, and you can tell what kind of hardware. Anybody ever really think about telling the hardware from what you might see in, as simple as a taskbar? We're not even looking at a whole screenshot. We're looking at just a taskbar. You know it's a laptop because? There you go. So you can put these things together. Um, what else can you tell about a laptop? It's plugged in, obviously. You see the AC power. So it's plugged in. What about the speaker icon? You notice that's muted? So somebody muted their speakers. That doesn't happen accidentally. I mean, these are, these are the little things. Think, why would somebody mute their speakers? There's got to be a reason for that. A gamer's not going to mute their speakers. It'd be kind of silly. defeats the point. It's right there. This, and this, this man right here wins the no prize. Um, this screenshot, I'll tell you, was from, I don't know if it was this laptop, but one of my other laptops in an airport. And I didn't want to disturb the people around me, and I didn't want it to play my vulgar language from Binary Revolution Radio tonight at 11 o'clock in this room. Be there. Um, so yes, there's absolutely, so put, see, when I, see how you kind of start with one thing and kind of build up to what it actually means? Um, the software that's being used, you can see the icon in the center. Everybody recognize that probably? Yeah. Microsoft Outlook. What about the one next to it? Now, this is one of my favorite examples, the one right to the left of that. Trillion. trillion. Whoops, trillion. Not only is that trillion, there's actually something else you can pull out of that little icon. There's more information in that little icon, believe it or not. Well, it's not the professional one, it's the free version. Well, it, I, don't, I honestly don't know that. That's, I never heard that before. That, that, that's a good one. Um, does anybody, is anybody very familiar with Trillion right here? Trillion, of course. Actually, let me back up. Yes, if I back up, for those of you who don't know Trillion, I'm assuming everybody does, but let me back up. Trillion is uh, a chat client that will communicate with AOL Messenger, whatever that thing's called, MSN Messenger, Yahoo Messenger, et cetera, et cetera, all of them in one place. But the icon, right, so there's two circles there, whatever, that icon. If you're connected to all of the available networks, let's say you have an AOL and an MSN and a Yahoo. If you're connected to all of them, both of those bubbles light up yellow. And this one, you can see that only the top one is lit up, which means they're not connected to all of the possible networks that are available. What does that mean? Maybe nothing. But this is what we call building that case, building that preponderance of evidence. So how many people actually knew that the, each little icon is not just this is the software they're using. There's actually a lot more information in a lot of them. So um, and, and also, go outside of the icons. As you see under other, you can see the network icon is showing. They're connected to a network somewhere, obviously. You know, that tells you a little bit more. Um, I'm sorry? Right, yeah, actually, very good point. Absolutely. And again, this is going to fall under the might be important, might not be. But the timestamp, the timestamp on this was 337. 
Or, or what about, think, what about this? What if that timestamp didn't say 13? What if it said 1537? Somebody's doing military. Why would, you know, what kind of person would use military time? You know, just, just things like that. <laughs> some people might, some people might have reasons to do. Um, so, and actually that's a little Easter egg, and if anybody knows it, you can come up to me afterwards. 337 has some significance to us. Not 1337, but 337. If you look on your phone keypad, you'll figure that out maybe. All right, so first one I kind of walked through. This one I'm going to kind of throw out and let everybody play along with this. Again, first of all, operating system. Windows XP, there you go. Uh, what kind of hardware do you see? Wireless network. Wireless network. That's not connected. Right. Right. It's running on battery power. It is not plugged in. Good point. Yep. Well, actually, I'm, I'm going to go with that. It's not, but you're on, you're on the right track of something else here. That, that is actually, and if anybody here is very familiar with Dell, that's the application that will ship with all the Dells for their built-in internal card. And I purposely did this. This is very, very, you probably, I don't even know if you can see it well on the overhead out here, but you might notice that the wallpaper, I purposely clipped off some of the wallpaper that, yeah, you guys can't see, but from the wallpaper you can learn a lot as well. This is actually the default Dell wallpaper. This is a brand new uh, laptop I was setting up for work. And if you know, again, if you're familiar with Dell and a lot of people roll them out at their jobs or whatever, you can recognize a lot of the Dell things that come along with it. I was going to say that they have to register their office. Boom, yeah. So we'll, we'll jump straight to software. That's a great one. The icon on the far left. Does that, now, now, building with our case that we're building up here, does that fall in line with what I just said? A new laptop, it's been pre installed with Outlook, but they haven't activated it yet. So, see, we're building, okay, this is a new laptop. You know, so you're, you're getting a case of exactly what kind of user, who the person using this is. I'm going to pull out my watch here. Um, what other software do you see on there? Very obscure one. That's a good one. Anybody else pick that one up? You know what a download manager, what the goal of a download manager is? Download manager in most cases, and in this case, which helps build a profile of this user, is if um, you're downloading something on an unstable network and it crashes halfway through, you don't want to have to start all over again. You want it to automatically pick up where it left off. Or you want it to open up multiple channels and try to pull it faster, et cetera, et cetera. So what kind of person would need such a thing? You know, it might be, might be a where's puppy. I don't know. It could be. Um, right there, you got it. I all sit in my, this again is from my laptop. I'll go ahead and tell you now. We're putting that case together that shows this was from a laptop that I was setting up for work. I was sitting at home watching TV in my living room on my wireless, and I was downloading all the updates and everything, and I didn't want to lose them, so that's one of the first things I installed on here. One other icon right there, second one from the left. Again, Dell. If you recognize the Dell, that comes with, that's that damn annoying Dell alert that you, oh, I won't even go into a rant on that thing. Um, sound, obviously, the speakers. Microsoft Money came pre-installed as well. But if, we already know this is a pre-installed system, but Money's kind of a more indication of more of a home user, wouldn't it be? A business isn't really going to use Microsoft Money. They're going to use some more professional accounting package of some kind. So Microsoft Money could be a student, maybe, something like that. But, I mean, out of, out of this room of hackers, how many of you have Microsoft Money installed? Yeah, so you, you can eliminate certain groups of people, and that's, again, the point of the whole presentation. So the conclusion, I've already kind of told you. Again, the timestamp in this case, not a whole lot of significance, but it tells you that I, what time I took the screenshot, obviously. But yeah, it's a pretty good case, and everybody sees all the evidence is there of what I described. This is me sitting there installing a brand new computer. Well, that's a temporary. Yes, that's an absolutely, that's absolutely a good point. In this case, it was just temporary because I was playing around with it. And, but yeah, they could, since that can be easily turned off and on, yeah. But, it, but it's absolutely one of those things you list. When I go back to the, that slide I showed at the beginning of making that case, that could be maybe a plus one or a minus one and kind of build all those and go in that direction until you get, get a good profile of, of where you're going. Now, this isn't just for, for the... Um, taskbar, obviously, this can be used for anything you see on the screen. And this one, 
Again, Windows XP, obviously. But what programs do you see? Can anybody, I don't know if you guys can see that, especially maybe in the back. So maybe somebody up front can kind of help us out here. But some programs on there that maybe stand out as different. Like Microsoft Office isn't exactly different. But for example, you probably see on here Power Toys. Power toys. OK, what kind of person has Power Toys installed? Yeah. You know? A power user of some kind. That's not something that you know, the, the receptionist is going to have installed on her computer or something like that. Um, you see, uh, um, OK, how about Nero 7? Why would you have that installed if you don't have a CD burner? You just got a clue about hardware from the software once again. What does it mean? Again, maybe nothing, but keep it in context. Um, iTunes. Do you see iTunes there? Possibly they have an iPod? Maybe? That's what I, that's exact, that was my, that was my trick question. I've got it in the notes here. That's a total red herring. That's why you want to enumerate all of them. Don't depend on any one thing. When you install that stupid um, QuickTime. QuickTime, it automatically puts that iTunes in there now. So, ah, see, that's a tricky one right there. Um, how about, uh, let's see what else. I don't want to spend too much time on it, but um, Palm thing at the bottom, right. Now, as far as I know, that doesn't install by default with anything, but it, may, it probably means somebody has some sort of Palm device that they use with their laptop. And, and they obviously we know that that comes with um, Windows XP. You can use the built-in command line or Internet Explorer or you know, any browser will support FTP. But this person went above and beyond to get a, an FTP program for some reason. Actually, I would never heard that. That's a good point. Yeah, absolutely. Absolutely, because they're completely by default order. Of course, you can go in and alphabetize them, sort them, or whatever. But yeah, in this case, I did not do that. That's, that's a very good point. I didn't catch that. They've got, this person might be paranoid. They've got a couple of antivirus on there. Um, man, you guys are throwing out all kinds of stuff. Oh, man, you guys are so, you, I don't even, you guys could give the presentation. You're doing great. You're naming every one of these little things, like, throw them on the desktop. That's me. Move it later. Put it on the desktop for now. But not only that, if, and again, I know people can't read some of the file names, but if you can look, you can see, like, the, uh, the at the very top, there's an MP3 file. Yeah. At, does anybody know that icon, what it's associated with? Winamp. 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 Everybody recognizes that, probably. Got it. Maybe that, that's actually random. It'll randomly assign you something when you yeah. So um, that could be anything. Um, look at the and again, I know some of you can't see the file names, but the file names on a couple of those MP3s. You may not recognize it. DJ Snyder space something there. Um, F Bill F Bill Radio. Anybody know? may not know what that is from looking at the screenshot, but you can go and search for it later on your search engine of choice. We won't mention the G word. Whatever your search engine of choice is, and find out. And now you're building not only a profile of the computer, but even more of the person. They're into this type of music. They listen to these particular shows. You what if? A screen name right there, too. Yeah, well, yeah. <laughs> that gives it away, too. But I mean, I could make up a screen name with your handle on it just as easily. That's not, you know. But yeah, absolutely. There's so many things. Some of them are more obvious than others like that, of course. I put another little, not an Easter egg, but if you notice in the bottom right, I have a window open in my taskbar that's G, Miss, and then Art of Deduction, which is the name of the presentation. So G drive, that's not something that's normally mapped by default. You've got a lot of drives if you're up to G. So this is probably on maybe an external card or mapped to a drive on a network somewhere. You know, just little things. Now you've built up somebody who has network access, who's a power user, who has all these things installed. Right. Absolutely. Well, and like, I, and I don't know if this is maybe a little obscure, but Windows Explorer, if you notice, is on my anything above that line. Uh, you see, there's four things: Mozilla Firefox, Thunderbird, Media Player, and Windows Explorer. Windows Explorer doesn't go on there by default. Somebody went out of their way to put that there. 
So in my case, I go browse my files directly a lot, so I put that there. But what if you would have seen that accounting software? Somebody's using this almost exclusively for account. They, they use it so much that they're going to put it right up at the top where it doesn't move. The ones below the line rotate based on use. Right. So. Hey, and what kind of user might use Notepad? Well, and actually, here's another thing I didn't really think about, but you guys are giving me ideas too, is if you look through a lot of these applications, you're seeing quite a few pieces of different shareware, open source software and stuff. This person obviously gets around and knows how to, to get what they want. So, yeah, that, I mean, we could, we could sit here and there's a ton. Do you see how this kind of build up and how fun and putting all these things together? So we're going to move on to a couple others here. How about your browser window? And we're gonna go, we're gonna start going through these a little bit more quickly because you get everybody's obviously gotten the point. I mean, you guys are beating me. You're giving me stuff I didn't find before. So so you guys have probably got this down. But there's also some fun things in here. Uh, first of all, the browser and operating system that is being used. We know some browsers don't work on certain operating systems, so that helps isolate it. But um, this person isn't that tech savvy, otherwise they wouldn't have all those Unless, huh? Unless they were purposely setting up a screenshot for this presentation. Um, branded by Comcast, so we know what cable network this person uses. Their cable modem. Man, doesn't everybody have Binrev on their toolbar? No, not yet. <laughs> Binrev.com, check it out. You can download this presentation from my site, stankdog.com. All the stuff, that, all the articles I've had in 2600. Sorry, side note, advertising, doc droppers, et cetera, et cetera. I'm sorry, go ahead. <laughs> yeah. Can I squish this? <laughs> squish this all down. Um, here's a couple other little things besides, yeah, you see the links and the plugins. Um, take a look at, for example, <laughs> yeah, you know, I, wow, that's a that's really good. Yeah, that's absolutely right. <laughs> Notice how many. Okay, so let's look at the individual toolbars. And this is where, at the very beginning, I said the more experience you have and the more things you recognize, um, the Google toolbar. If you have some experience with it, you see it's got the pop-up blocker, and it's blocked a lot of stuff. See, I caught myself there. A lot of stuff. So they've had it installed for a while. You know, this isn't a new computer, so somebody can't say, oh, no, I just installed this. Oh, no, you've had it for a while. <laughs> Either that or you're going to a lot of prawn sites with pop-up. That's not me, though. That, that <laughs> they let the tools install themselves in their own bars. Otherwise, that would be more organized. Or they're paranoid of spyware and adware, absolutely. Um, look over on the far right-hand side of the Google toolbar. You see Snagit. Does anybody know what Snagit is? software is screen capturing software so this person has a reason to do that maybe they make screen captures of videos recordings for something like I don't know hacktv.org pimp pimp why well, I'm getting a lot of pr uh, publicity in here um, um, product placement that's the word I was, I was struggling for the word there product placement uh, the Yahoo toolbar actually gives you a little bit more um, focus target. This is actually some useful stuff here. If you, and again, it's experience. You know what comes with default with the Yahoo toolbar. By default with Yahoo, it doesn't put these things over here like fantasy sports. This user gets into fantasy sports for some reason, and that kind of narrows it down to a lot of people, especially in hackers. Am I the only fantasy sports here in the hacking community? Okay, <laughs> okay, one more. So that narrows it down a lot as well. So again, a lot of, um, a lot of stuff. Actually, a couple more obscure ones just for the heck of it. In the very top, um, there's, you see the, uh, gosh, I need a laser pointer. The very top there, the ones on the far right, uh, looks like the AOL icon guy there, and there's a couple other between. Does anybody recognize those? You used a lot of instant Yeah, they probably, yep, they've got MSN on there. The little dollar sign right there, party poker. No? So this is somebody who's online playing poker. Someone has trillion Which, and that narrows it down. Yeah, and, and well, you know, and, and put, now that we've got this big footprint, now let's step back again. Let's do the analysis part of it. We can kind of tell what type of user it is, but we've got enough in just this one to really pinpoint. We know this person is, has a Yahoo account because they got a Yahoo toolbar. They've probably got a Google account. And maybe not. not. It's not required for the Google toolbar, I don't think. Anybody correct me on that? 
Okay, but you, for the Yahoo account, for you to have your those custom links and stuff in there, you have to have a Yahoo account for that. So you put all that together. You know they've got a party poker account. They play partypoker.net. So you've got all of these things. You've really pinpointed it down. If you were a uh, detective trying to find this for real and trying to pinpoint, get the information from Party Poker, find it from Yahoo, put it all together. You're not going to get. You're going to get a pretty pretty good handful of people. Yeah, that's. See, you guys are giving me all kinds of. Every time I give this, there's so much that no, you know, it's great. I keep coming, keep them coming. Thank you. <laughs> All right, so um, again, this is another one. Um, very quickly through this, because let me see how I am on time here. No, we're, we're okay. Um, very quickly through this one, different browser, but still looks like Windows XP using Firefox. It even says multiple Firefox on there. Um, again, notice the links. You see the BinRev link on there. Um, there's a couple other interesting things in these links. Now, we're getting very precise and very detailed, but I want everybody back up and think of the overview that you're looking for specific things that you can build that case on. And then we're using examples to illustrate them. Um, IMDB, that's an interesting link to have. Um, they have three different search engines. It's someone who doesn't have any allegiance to one particular search engine, the big G, somebody who actually wants to mix up their searches for whatever reason. Um, Tiny URL is an interesting thing to have. Um, how about, there's, there's two on here that are really, the very next one that says post to meme stream. Does anybody here familiar with meme streams? Good friend of mine, Decius, and uh, Rattle run a site meme streams, which is a um, social bookmarking site, uh, kind of like slash dot, things along those lines, uh, based on a memetics engine. Um, but that's a post to. I can go to a web page that I find interesting and click that button. It's a little JavaScript applet that will post that entry to my particular blog on the site. So this person must have a meme streams account. Well, you've narrowed it down quite a bit once again. And let's see, Wayback Machine. The, the very last one that says press it, does anybody recognize that? I'm, I'm hoping somebody will get this one. Press it. Who said that? WordPress, there we go. WordPress. That is the same thing if you, it's a little Java thing that will post uh, an entry to your blog. And you're not posting entries to other people's blogs, are you? <laughs> well, I guess in some cases you can, but mostly you're posting to your own blog. So it says right there, digital doll cut off or whatever. So that's my site. I pretty much, this one pretty much nails it down to who it is again. Right, And if you know the StumbleUpon toolbar, when you do go to a site, you can post comments and things like that. If it's a site you've been to and added a comment, the entries on that will change. The colors will change, and you'll, you'll know that this person has been to this particular site before. But you haven't voted whether you liked it or not. Right, right. And this, yeah, this was just put on again for the screenshot. So, um, yeah, yeah, absolutely. Stangdog at gmail.com if anybody cares. Um, uh, again, I'll briefly go through this one. IRC, everybody's getting the point, so I'm really going to speed up through a couple more of these. Um, you know they're using what client? They're using Merck, obviously. But you can see in that screenshot, you can tell what username I was using, what I was logged in as. So this is more like your shoulder surfing. You want to find out who they're logged in as. Is he so-and-so? Is that so-and-so? What are they doing? There you see their username. You can see what um, server they're connected to. This is our... Been rev so you can see what channel they're in. I just chopped this off because it's pretty self-explanatory. What usernames, anything else like that. You can get a timestamp on this as well, depending on what the topic is. You see the topic of the channel is Ben Rev Radio 134 this Tuesday. So 134 with Mark Spencer. What what time frame was that? That was, you know, we're all, we're gonna be doing 157 tonight at eleven o'clock. So 
you know, 20 some episodes ago. So you can get a time frame of exactly when the screenshot was taken as well. If that wasn't there, well, you're on down mail still. If cigarettes are not posted on down mail anymore. Not anymore, right. Instant Messenger clients. Uh, I, this, these are just replies from the first, um, first Google image search. All these, and look at all the plain usernames. People take screenshots. I mean, I could harass any one of these people if I wanted to be a jerk. I mean, they're posting their usernames, all their list of all their buddies. You know, let's think of, you know, the bad things can happen with that. You can go impersonate any of these people. You can pretend to be, oh, I'm a friend of so-and-so, yeah, you know, et cetera. It could be dangerous to, to have some of that kind of stuff out there, but you can learn a lot of stuff from it. Did I do that? Check, check, check. got physical access to some of the files any better what do I have to eat the thing hello <laughs> check check any better okay um, so what if you actually got physical access to some of the files even if it was for temporarily getting access grab some files to pull them off well you look at the metadata and again a lot of people probably know about metadata so I'm gonna skim through this quickly but metadata is actually data about data. That's the Wikipedia definition, and I think it's a great definition, very simple and to the point, data about data. So what kind of files use metadata? Image files, document files, music, could be anything, really. Um, it's all in the file specifications and what the file contains, um, and what kind of data do they attach. For example, ID3, I think, is a great example of this because you're going to put the author, the title, um, the genre, all these other, there's a lot of stuff in that ID3 tag. That's a form of metadata. It's data about the rest of the data, about that MP3 file. So metadata can be really, really cool. XML is the rock store. It is awesome. It's a great way to um, export and import data. Um, and here's a really good example. This is a fun story. This is my, uh, two good friends of mine, Acidus and Virgil, who um, did a presentation at Interzone 2 a couple years back, uh, the Blackboard case where they presented some vulnerabilities in Blackboard software, and you can go do the research on that. It probably would be too in-depth to go into it here, but uh, basically they got a cease and desist because Blackboard didn't want this information released. Well, the cease and desist was sent in Microsoft Word format. So I took the file. This was several years ago. So they I took the file. I opened it up, and I see this comment in there, and I don't know if anybody can read it, but it says... Um, this section gets us nowhere. We're airing our dirty laundry, and this supports the notion that we picked on two kids. They don't have spell check. They couldn't spell picked right. We claim things, and they deny them. Way to embed embarrassing stuff in there. And I have the X, or not, we won't call that XML. That's Microsoft's bastardized XML. We won't go there. Um, to show that that's actually embedded in that data. And I can go in there and look at the properties of that document file, and I can tell the author, it, this was the second revision, so probably the secretary typed it, handed it to the lawyer. He added his little comments and then made a fool of himself. I can tell the company name. hope they don't come after me now because of that. 
Um, but it's public information that's out there on Google. You can find it anywhere. It tells the date that it's created. They can't deny that they didn't say this. They can't deny that this isn't a file from them. It's, it's right there in plain text, and it's not really much they can say to deny it. Um, true, true. You can artificially change metadata, but you can get into deeper levels of forensics to prove real actual dates and things like that. That's totally could be a whole presentation in and of itself, but it's pretty damning evidence. We'll put it like that. Great. Even if you don't turn change tracking or whatever that thing is on, every time you pass something back and forth, Microsoft is logging all that stuff. Microsoft Office doc format or whatever. I don't know how to terminology to explain it, but it logs all that stuff. And here's a neat little trick. If you ever find, I found this with someone at work one time before. They, they had this file that was about three or four pages long, but it was 10 megs. Why, and they're asking me, why is this file so big? It's only a couple pages long. So copy and paste that text out, put it in a new file, send it back. Here it is. It's cleaned up. And then I you know, look to see what's really in the file that's taking up this 10 megs because it's data. It's not, you know, it's all these undoes and all these iterations of stuff they had done in the past. So uh, lots of stuff that's kept kept in the in the document. And there are tools out there if you're worried or concerned about that. You should always go through. There's tools you can download. I think even Microsoft caved in and made one that will strip a lot of that metadata out for your for privacy reasons. Um, let's see, EXIF properties in Windows XP, the screenshot we have here, metadata in photos. Again, you're building a case, so I'm not going to spend too much time on this, but you can see the equipment make um, that's stamped in there by default, the camera model. That's the type of camera the person used. So um, if you, someone can't claim they didn't take this picture of that picture, you got some nasty prawn, and they come pounding on your doors, and you're not going to say you didn't take it. If you've got the camera model, it's dated, it's time stamped. Uh, notice at the bottom there's author and keywords. Those are optional. But if somebody actually put those in and synced it with their camera, it's going to stamp that in there as well. And now you've really damned yourself. But the other funny thing, and I'll, I'll throw this out. I'm not going to give any examples of this. But another funny thing, I did find some. You go to someone's site and find they've got pictures of their vacation and their kids sledding in the winter and smiles. And then somewhere else, they've got those private pictures with their wife that they put on some site they didn't think anybody would ever find. But coming from the same time frame, same camera type, same author tagged in there, you can get yourself in some embarrassing situations. So, uh, again, date, time, pinpoint, some of the general, again, circumstantial evidence, but never give them any more information. And this is something that I talk about on the radio show a lot. Never voluntarily give more information than you have to. Those things are blank by default. Don't put in your author name. You don't really have a reason to unless you're a professional photographer. You want to copyright it or something like that. But you should be making creative comments. Now, here's one example that I made up. Um, one other thing that's kept in, um, in metadata is thumbnails sometimes. So um, this is a good example. My very good friend, Alanka, who I'm going to bump into here in a week or two. Uh, good friend, Alanka. This is a picture of her from Freak Nick uh, Conference down in the southeast. Thumbnail of the image. Now, you see the image name up there, IMG 0102001, and it tells all of the properties of that image. Well, notice that thumbnail in the bottom right corner. That's embedded in the metadata. That is part of the image. Okay? Now, we're going to go to the next screen. I opened this up, and I edited it. And I, my graphic skills are the succor, so all I could do was type a big white box over there that says, We love Alanka. Um, but I did save it. That is an edit. That's a change to the picture. The thumbnail does not get updated, especially in older applications. It does not update that metadata and update. New versions of Photoshop, they added that feature in there when they realized what was happening. And is everyone in the room above 18? There's a famous example I'll go to. <coughs> um, actually, I'll do how to find metadata. Um, native support in the OS. So you saw some of those screenshots I was doing were just right-click and properties or application specific like ID3 tags. And there are several tools out there. There's these Java libraries if you actually wanted to do it from the programming side of things. There's some other tools you can download. Um, or you can actually go in and hex edit 
the data itself. And you'll see earlier, you saw the, let's see, can I go backwards? Yeah. You saw the camera name there, Eastman Kodak, et cetera, CX7430. Well, you don't have to use the properties of the limits of the operating system. Open that thing up in a hex editor, hex editor of choice, and you can actually see the data there. You see in the bottom, it says Eastman Kodak Company. It's in a little bit different format. You got the end of line markers and control characters and things like that in there. But you can see that data. So yeah, Cat Schwartz, famous example of this. I didn't know who this was, to be honest with you, because I didn't have cable. But apparently, this was a host of tech TV show, some tech TV show. And she put these two pictures up on her page. And you know, looking all sultry and seductive and all that good stuff. And um, you know, should you be worried about something like this? Well, these are private pictures. And as I said earlier, there's a thumbnail that's kept in those images. So even with you edit it, like for example, you only wanted to show off the eyes or something like that, and forget to update that. Okay, I had to edit. I had to edit the naughty bits because I didn't know. If, you know, I didn't want to get in any trouble. But you notice these are a little grainy because these were thumbnails that were ex expressed or expanded. I don't know what the proper term would be. That they were pulled out of those thumbnails, so they're not as high quality as the other pictures. But yeah, you trim those pictures and don't do the update, then yeah, you can get yourself in an embarrassing situation. And she did. Of course, she has nothing to be embarrassed about if you ask me. But we'll go on from there. <laughs> um, so, well, what else? Let me let me see. I want to speed up here. I don't want to miss anything. Um, Microsoft. This is another great example. One of my favorite examples. Um, Microsoft busted in piracy. They they had an excuse, but we'll we'll get to that in a second. And you can open this up right, while I talk. If you anybody's using XP, you can open it up right now. There's a path at the bottom. You can browse to that and look at these files, and you will see it on your laptops right now. You can have evidence of this. Um, this is one of the WAV files, one of their sound files in their help. And if you go into the WAV file, do a hex edit on it, you see this little tag at the very end. And some of you might not recognize it. It's kind of obscure, but Deep Zone, ISFT SoundForge 4.5. Well, we know what editing program they used to create these WAV files. It was SoundForge version 4.5. But the key here is the word Deep Zone. Deep Zone is the name of a cracker. This is a cracked version <laughs> of SoundForge 4.5. And it's in every copy of Windows XP. So Microsoft's excuse was we outsourced the sound production to another company. We didn't do that. But they can't deny it. They can't say, no, we didn't use it. Yeah, you did. <laughs> so when he did the crack, it would add that to the files. So here's the last example. So the first two were kind of funny. This one's a little bit more serious and a little bit more scary and a little bit maybe more close to home for some people. And this is great because it's a fairly recent example. Um, keep in mind the legalities, especially for defense. There was an interview in the Washington Post, as you see dated there, and you can certainly reference this and, and verify that it's all true. Um, and it had, well, they, they did an interview with this guy. I don't know how you pronounce his name, if it's zero, by, zero x 80 or off by 80, offset 80, whatever. And um, did an interview with him. And it had IPTC information. Now, IPTC is another form of metadata. It's an optional form of metadata that's used by uh, the Associated Press because they have these giant databases of all these photos, these stock photos that they use for their stories, and they mix them all up. Well, they add all this optional extra data into their photos. <clears throat> so they're doing a story on this 0 by 80 guy who was running botnets, bragging about how many millions of dollars he'd made from scamming people out of money, all this fraud that he's committed. They did an interview and kept him truly all this anonymous stuff. Oh, but they accidentally put the city and the state in the IPTC information. So, okay, well, okay, fine. You nailed, narrowed it down to a city. You know, if it was New York City, you know, you'd have a little problem. But this is Roland, Oklahoma. So, a little bit more extra research. Again, get your utility belts, go Batman on them. Um, and actually, a lot of this was detective work from people on Slashdot. Um, the article itself gives you a lot of clues. You know that this person was 21 years old, that he had blonde hair that covering his eyebrows, that he's skinny, et cetera, et cetera. They've narrowed him down physically quite a bit. You know that he smokes and that he even prefers Marlboro. They, you know, get details on the story, you know, hard-hitting journalism there. Um, lives with his parents in a brick rambler. Mother, mother is a real extreme Christian, dog, southern accent, et cetera. He's a high school dropout. Well, you know, in a town like that, how many high schools could they have and how many people dropped out, you know? Uh, you know he was an AOL customer seven years ago. Yeah, sorry about that. Um, and that he even says that he lives near a used car, a lot of gas station, convenience store, and a strip club. 
Well, you take that a step further, mix all of that together. Well, fact, Roland, Oklahoma has a total population of around 3,000 people. 3,000, you've already narrowed it down to. Remember that preponderance of evidence to build down and narrow down to find the person you're looking for? Probably went to either Roland or Muldrow High School, the only two high schools in the area. You know, pretty, pretty straightforward that that's going to be pretty accurate. Citydata.com reports that there were only about 40 people in that town that were that age in the year 2000. Do a little math and math, figure out what age he was in 2000. Only about 40 people. You've narrowed it down to 40 possible people now. And the fact that he told where he lives, Google Maps will give you the coordinates that he's somewhere between that strip club, that convenience store, and that used car lot, somewhere at those coordinates. And you can actually go and Google Map the whole thing. So, kind of scary that here you are giving an anonymous interview, and there's presentations that have been done at Hope in the past that you should definitely check out about how to talk to the media and be careful you don't give them stuff like this. And don't, especially if you're running a botnet ripping people off, don't be a retard anyway. That would be stupid. What a moron, but I won't. Anyway. So, before we wrap it up, what kind of profile did you make about me? You've been watching this whole thing, so now I'm going to stand back. What, first of all, kind of cheated here, what kind of laptop am I using? A Dell. Um, what software did I use to make this presentation? This template's pretty common. PowerPoint. PowerPoint, I heard somewhere. Um, obviously, if I use PowerPoint, I'm running what operating system? Put all this stuff together about me. Did I admit that I used some other things earlier during the presentation? That I had a Google account, for example, Yahoo accounts, fantasy sport. I gave you a lot of stuff. I don't know if anybody was keeping all that in inventory as we went along, but I gave you a lot of information about me just from presenting just from showing a lot of this stuff, what websites I frequent, what ones I post to. I have an account at meme streams, uh, party poker, things like that. So you can get a pretty accurate profile from me just from this presentation today. So that's about it. Uh, give shouts out to the Digital Dog Pound, several of them over here. Uh, you can go to digitaldogpound.org, which is the blog. Like I haven't already pimped the sites enough, sankdog.com. You can download this presentation. All of the presentations I've given at Hope, DEF CON, all of them you can download from there. All of the articles I've had, all from stankdog.com. And binrev.com, we've mentioned great forums, lots of cool people there, lots of stuff to learn. Binrev.com, the addiction. And to my local binrev meetings. This presentation, and this is, this is to everybody, this presentation, that very first image that you saw of the little taskbar was me flying for work. And I looked at my taskbar and I went, wow, that's kind of cool, that little trillion thing down there. You know, I'm like, I wonder if my guys at my meeting would recognize that. That's how this presentation started. This whole thing started off as just that little screenshot. And we're like, oh, that's kind of neat. I wonder what else we can come up with. So I went to the meeting thinking, oh, this would just be a silly little side note. And we all started looking around. Hey, what else could we find? What else could we find? So I actually put together several other screenshots, put it together into a 15-minute thing. Now we've got a full presentation looking at metadata and all of the information that you can find out. Again, I made up the term electronic deduction, but it seems fitting of all this stuff. But any of you, even these little things that you find interesting, other people are going to find interesting or fun. I mean, this was kind of fun. I mean, did anybody learn anything from this? There's a lot of new stuff in here, right? I mean, it's nothing that was above anyone's head. You know, it's all stuff that you've known before, but kind of putting it together in such a way that it's like, wow, that's, that's kind of cool that I can isolate stuff like that. So, yeah, give, give presentations at your local BINREV meetings, at your local 2600 meetings, whatever you meet, whatever you call them, it doesn't matter. Meeting with people, making little presentations, you never know what you might get out of it. So, I've got a couple minutes, so if you can tear away from the spinning monkey, the mesmerization of... The, if you have any questions, we've got maybe five minutes left, three or four minutes left, so I'd be happy to answer anything if I can. But I may have more questions for some of you guys out there. You guys are giving me lots of good stuff. So, I'm sorry? Um, that was actually off of your blog, wasn't it? No? No, oh, sorry. Oh, okay. Take a JPEG into Photoshop and edit it. Thank you. And uh, bring it and bring and then check out. Um, like if you open up the uh, JPEG in uh, Edit Plus, which I think you were using to look at the source. Um, Photoshop also puts in some data about. I'm pretty sure there's a time in there when it was edited, and then that original EXIF data was still there when the photo was taken. Um, so you can also check for photo ma manipulations that way, if um, no thumbnail was saved. Yeah, a lot of
uh, and those Photoshop things get debunked. Yeah, it, it will also put uh, you know metadata in, and it will say when it was edited, what software it was edited with. So very another cool. way of checking if photos have been very edited. Very cool. Very cool. Uh, right. Yeah. Right there. Yeah, you said uh, there was ways of telling if somebody was messing with the metadata, like if somebody used like well, an like XF writer saying, yeah. or something like that. You, you, you made it sound like there's ways that you could kind of prove that. How would you do that? Well, you can change. I mean, that's really I, – I I'll, I'll probably come down and talk afterwards because you can get into a lot of it, and, and that's not my area of expertise. But there are forensics things that can go through there. And mostly what he's describing is the, what I was thinking of was just going back, and there were iterations, kind of like what I described with the Microsoft document how it keeps a lot of that stuff in there, but there are applications customly, custom designed that will do that, that they sell to law enforcement and security and stuff like that that will rip it out. Or, like he said, Edit Plus is what I use and I can go through. Good eye, by the way, that was a good catch. There's a presentation on those tools Sunday. What's that? There's a presentation on those tools Sunday. Well, great, so there you go, come back Sunday, what time? <laughs> oh, also, tonight, for some people who came in here towards the end, tonight, 11 o'clock, Binary Revolution Radio Season 4, Episode Number 1. Come back. We'll have some more fun. Probably be a lot more colorful language at that one. This one was a little bit more low-key because I was trying to get some points across. We're going to have fun for that. No, no, come, come. And um, Black Ratchet doing Phone Freaking 101 tomorrow at 12 o'clock in this very room. Make sure you come check that out. Uh, okay, right here. Oh, I was just going to expand upon that point about the forensics. Basically, what you do is you go back and you track with the computer that the person used. You look at file access times, file created times, if they used, uh, accessed it over a network, you've got that data on the, the servers and that kind of thing, you know, as far as the forensic tracking of it. Right. Yeah, and actually there's, there's um, it's kind of, I don't like the way Microsoft does that turn tracking on. It, it's tracking anyway. You know, that's just kind of like this way to say, oh, yeah, turn tracking on to make it easier for you to follow other people's. But just keeping a lot of that old metadata on its own anyway and yeah, okay, we got to cut off here, so oh. anyway, thank you very much. Uh, short notice, I'm sorry, we are, if you're here to see the other one, is it going to be canceled? The, the original one is canceled that was supposed to be here? Yeah, so that one was, has been canceled, but there is still a presentation coming up at 1230 tonight after our show, so come back and check that out, and thanks again for your, for your time.